Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Paul Lewis. Uh, welcome to today's Eno Center webinar. I hope that everyone is staying safe and healthy. Um, I'm going to be moderating today's webinar on automated vehicle technology, public policy, and BMW's Level 3 AV system. Um, of course, as we know, most of the uh, automated or most of the transportation-related news, news has been focused on COVID-19 recovery. Um, but we have noticed that automated vehicle technology is progressing um, behind the scenes. Um, a few months ago, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, or NHTSA, posted a new VSSA, a Voluntary Safety Self-Assessment, for a BMW's Level 3 automated vehicle system. Um, we at Eno reviewed this document, but found it really compelling. Um, and so we thought we would invite a few experts um, from BMW to hear about their level three system, learn about the current uh, development of AV technology, um, and get insights as to where AV policy is on a, on a global basis. Um, and so we've invited two guests today. Um, the first is uh, Simon Furst. He is the principal expert for automated driving technologies at BMW. Um, he has a, a background in aerospace engineering where he worked in the, the first part of his career um, and he joined BMW in 2003 and uh, most recently has been the general manager for the Division of Aut Autonomous Driving and Driver Assistance, responsible for machine learning, reasoning, and knowledge representation. Um, and line, he's a line manager for agile development teams. Um, and last October, he was appointed as principal expert for automated driving technologies. And this is a um, you know, his, his background is in more detail on the website, so if you want more information about his background, um, please take a look at, uh, at the webinar website. Um, we're also expecting his colleague, Armin Greater, to join. Uh, I think that there's been a few technical difficulties, so Simon's going to lead this one. Uh, but I will introduce Armin, because um, he was certainly helpful in creating this webinar, and um, we're expecting him to join uh, very soon. Um, Armin is the Head of Strategy for Autonomous Driving and Driver Assistance at BMW. Um, he's had a whole career in safety, and so if you look again at the webinar website, you can get a, a really good sense of his background. But uh, at BMW, he was the, the project leader safety um, for their uh, Hydrogen 7, their Mini E, and other electric mobility projects. Um, he's uh, been a leader functional safety at BMW Group since 2009. Um, and most recently, he's been coordinating all BMW activities uh, to support world, worldwide deployment of SAE Automation Level 3. Um, so clearly someone who knows a lot about the system. Um, we, again, apologize for uh, his, uh, his technical difficulties, and we're hoping that, that he will join us shortly. Um, so just a quick note before I turn it over to Simon. Um, the webinar is scheduled for 30 minutes. Uh, Simon will present uh, for about 10 minutes or so on the BMW system, the state of play for automated vehicle technologies, um, and the state of play for the global AV policy. Um, if you have any questions at any time during this webinar, uh, the best way to uh, ask them is through the questions function on the GoToWebinar control panel. You'll see a, a little thing called questions, and you can click on that, type it in. I'm going to be taking those questions and asking them directly to Simon and Armin um, uh, after the presentation. And then of course, all slides and a recording of the, the webinar will be available on Eno's website in about an hour after this, this webinar. So um, without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Simon, who's gonna walk us through the state of play. Uh, Simon, please go ahead. Okay, thank you very much, Paul, for this very kind introduction. and. Thank you for, for everybody joining this webinar. So I can see it's um, mostly 400 people right now that are in here. This is really great um, to see all this interest in, in our presentation here. And I think this is just um, a nice picture of the next metro vehicle um, that we are going to launch mid next year. And this will be the vehicle where most of this brand new technology gets in. So um, please go to the next slide. So let me start with um, one slide on introduction to explain a little bit what is really driving us today. So as you can see on the left hand side, um, today's traffic is mostly characterized by primarily owned and sometimes also shared vehicles. And um, we put a strong effort in counting the accident statistics. 
We have strict regulations and on the vehicles and of course the whole traffic is controlled by traffic light signs and markings on the roads. But basically all this is really focusing on the human driver and his um, human behavior so that we can have a safe traffic at the end of the day. And for tomorrow, what do we see to change? So we still will have owned and shared vehicles, but they will also become automated as well, the owned as well as the shared vehicles. And of course, we will have an automatic traffic regulation. And basically with the automation, of course, we want to increase the quality of life and having more, let's say, free time also when being driven around by the car so that we can focus on something else, something more challenging, more interesting, instead of driving the vehicle in, in a traffic jam, like you can see it on the left-hand side. And of course, we have a kind of zero target vision. So this means we want to massively reduce and the number of accidents with this new kind of automated vehicles. This is one of the big promises this new automated driving brings with it. And of course, this is, let's say, the main change. We also need to optimize the whole traffic for being in a mixture with human drivers and automated driven systems. But the big question, as you can see in the middle, is when will this take place? And I think the clear PM understanding is this will take place, but it will take place at different points in times in different regions and different areas on the world. So next slide, please. So, but what's the most important thing? So when we introduce automated driving systems, and um, they must be safe. So automated driving systems need to be at least on the same safety level um, as the human driver, or as we um, say it here, we need to have a positive risk balance when we introduce these vehicles into the road. So this is the challenge for these automated systems. At the end, then traffic, the, the, the accident statistics should be reduced with having this automated vehicles on the road, as they should bring certain advantages the human driver cannot handle properly. And to design this, to derive this, um, criteria for achieving the positive risk balance, you can see this here on, on that line that you have to take um, into consideration certain different accident statistics from, from all over the globe and then derive out of that what is, let's say, the global average human driving performance so that you can um, really derive some kind of KPIs, some targets and how safe these vehicles must be when you enter them into the field when you bring them to the road. And of course, it's uh, the clear understanding with technology enhancing, they have to become safer and safer over time. And of course, we need to understand that this target might be different when you compare, as you can see here, um, accident statistics from US, Germany, China, whatever different regions of, of the world. And of course, you also have to properly consider under what kind of, let's say, conditions you operate these cars, or what kind of weather you have, what the age of the driver is, you compare this to. So there's a lot of influencing factors and we have to figure out of that, what is, let's say, the minimum criteria we have to pass so that we can achieve this positive risk balance. But the second also very important point is um, we have to avoid unreasonable risk. So this is, um, a little bit more complex to explain, but basically here the message is during development, we have to apply all the best practices and standards, all the good engineering knowledge we have today to really develop from the scratch safe vehicles. It's not just to demonstrate when they are on the road that there's a positive risk balance. It's also to give evidence during development that we have done all the best to really produce safe systems. And this is the, the two factors and the two main targets we have to work for. So on the next slide, please. Here we can see um, 12 safety principles we have derived. So these um, principles come from many different publications. And I think it's a summary and, and a kind of, of best of our collection that we address all the major topics. I will not explain them all in, in detail, but um, Perhaps let's start with one that is also very obvious and should never be forgotten. As this um, level three systems, they will also have a manual driving mode. This means they also can behave like regular vehicles. And this implies that they have all the current safety mechanisms, the passive safety we have today in vehicles. This will be kept also in this level three systems as let's say the basic safety features. And of course, it's also very important 
when these kind of vehicles switch between the manual driving mode where the human drivers and responsibility and the automated driving mode, there must be a very strict and clear HMI so that the human driver always can properly understand if he's in control of the vehicle or if the vehicle is driving on its own. So this is the vehicle initiated and handover aspects and the vehicle operator or driver initiated handover aspects. So this is um, very important that it's always clear who is really driving the, the vehicle. Another point is the operational design domain. So at the beginning, when we bring this product to the market, they will not be able to drive under every condition. And when it comes to lightning, to weather, like, for example, rain or things like that. So there are conditions where the vehicle cannot operate in an automated mode. So they need to switch back to the manual mode. And also this kind of um, operational design domain needs to be clearly recognized and understood by the vehicle and to decide if it can go to automated driving mode or not. Another also very important point is the behavior in traffic. So automated vehicles must behave very similar to manual driven cars. So manual driven cars driven by good manual drivers, of course, and not by drunken drivers or something like that, so that they really um, behave um, very similar to, let's say, um, good drivers as you expect, um, the driving from others. So this means that other drivers that still drive manual will not have sudden, let's say, surprises with automated vehicles as they behave very differently. So they must behave like human-driven vehicles at the end. Also important is, of course, the point of security. So everybody knows that an automated vehicle will be always online. They need map updates. They need some clearance for certain roads that there are no, let's say, um, road constructions or whatever. So they have a continuous, let's say, online connection. They also get um, software updates over time. And this is, of course, something that requires very strict security mechanisms. This is our this is very similar to what we have in the IT today. So here the automotive industry can very much benefit from the advantages of the IT industry as all the security has been developed there and we need to put this into the right, let's say, place into the automated vehicles. So here the automotive industry benefits from IT industry. And last but not least, um, I like to point out here the data recording. So it's our understanding that automated vehicles, they will have to do certain data recordings. Of course, always in compliance with, uh, let's say, the local um, privacy policies so that they record the data of the vehicle for multiple reasons. Of course, for post-processing when something went wrong, but also for data-driven development so that the OEM gets back some data, can analyze and what has happened, if there have been some new corner cases. So this will um, be the very best input to get for continuous improvement um, of the system itself. So let's go on to the next slide. So there I like to explain a little bit the architecture of the system, how it looks like. This is a top level picture showing, let's say, the fundamental principles of a level three system. In the lower part, you see the main channel. This is where you do the perception, prediction, and the driving policy based on all the sensors we have this in the vehicle to generate the very best trajectory the vehicle has to drive. So this is the nominal performance that is represented in that channel. And of course, we have to cross-check this continuously if this is really a safe trajectory at the end. For that reason, we have the safe channel just above that. And this one is um, always cross-checking via these two validators. If main channel and safe channel come up to trajectories, that do not cause any accidents. And in case these two channels come to a common conclusion, then let's say the most comfortable, the performance trajectory is selected and put to the motion control of the vehicle. In case these two validators do not um, come to a common conclusion, then the system goes to the um, fail degraded mode, to the fallback channel, which is shown on the upper side of this um, view graph. This is some extra sensors, some cameras and radars as a fallback scenario. And this is bringing the vehicle then when it's activated into a safe condition. So in the minimum risk condition, as we say. So typically this means that you have to stop the car in a 
well controlled way. This means either in the same lane of, of, of the road or even with um, turning to the rightmost lane and stopping there. This depends on the current driving situation. But this shows that we have some redundancy in such kind of architecture also with different electrical power supplies as shown here to really always be able to keep the vehicle in a safe state or to bring it into a safe state when something um, went, went wrong within the, the system. This might either be, let's say, on, on, on the, the nominal function, but this might also be due to a failure in one of the, the microprocessors being within the system. Okay, so let's go on to the next slide, how we come to all this kind of architectures and how we want to globally harmonize that. So BMW started um, last year an initiative named um, Safety First for Automated Driving. So we published this as a white paper mid of last year. And this was an initiative we did together with um, a couple of other 11 other companies from all over the globe. So took a lot of care that we have representative companies from the major regions, from Europe, from China, and four companies also from the US. And together with these companies, we tried to, let's say, analyze all these regulatory concepts that are out right now. You can see them here on the left-hand side, the European ones, what's going on in Japan. This is always very close to Europe. Of course, I'm from the US, what the NHTSA is doing here, and and also the initiatives in China and Korea. And we summarized all that and derived out of that the main content with respect on how to build a safe level three system in this white paper. And what we also considered was, let's say, the con consumer protection reports that are available from, from German initiatives, but also the NCAP, which are global, and other safety reports. So out of this, we derived the top level goals what ended up at the, uh, in, in the already presented um, 12 principles. And within that white paper, we created an even more detailed safety architecture as shown and on the previous slide. And we also put a lot of effort in explaining on the dedicated V and V activities that need to be done to really demonstrate that the vehicle is safe at the end of the day. This, this white paper being released by mid of last year, we immediately continued to put this onto ISO level. And this is what we just um, are on the way to finish by now, that this white paper got converted into an ISO technical report. The new number for that is 4804. And this report is to be um, released within the next month most properly. It always depends a little bit on the final editorial um, cross-checking on ISO level, but the content is basically finished of that report. And this is um, where we see that this is driving the global harmonization and standardization for safety on autonomous vehicles. Because this is our understanding, we need to force on, uh, to, to join all our forces to come up with, let's say, common conclusions on how to build safe automated vehicles. And it will not make any sense then the fundamental principles of safety within the vehicle from one OEM and another vehicle manufacturer are very differently at the end. And then it comes to, to different issues on the road and the customer um, cannot rely on any of these systems. We need to jointly define the level of safety that needs to be achieved in all these cars. And now let's come to the second last slide, please. These kind of initiatives um, are for our understanding also driving the, the regulatory frameworks you can see here in the middle. So currently we are um, just releasing here in, in Europe in UNECE, the automated lane keeping system, um, regulatory and, uh, um, uh, paper or, or regulation. And um, this is for level three, up to 60 kilometers per hour. And of course, we're working on, on regulations that go for 130 kilometers per hour, what's the typical maximum and beat on, on highways in Europe. And as you can see here with the other timelines, we continue them to further extend this. And um, as you can see below there also in the US, the NHTSA and um, voluntary safety guideline, this was exactly the motivation to have this webinar today as BMW put its own architecture that is of course in sync with that one I just presented from this white paper 
um, we put this into our um, self-assessment um, report and made it available on, on the NHTSA homepage for everybody to understand how we understand that safety shall look like in automated vehicles and how we are just realizing that for our next um, releases. And there are a couple of inputs into that regulatory frameworks. Of course, standards are driving this very much on ISO level. They are really international or all the, the, the nations from Japan via China, Korea, Europe, and the US, everybody's participating. So this is really a global initiative. But we also have to see that we have, let's say, more local um, funded projects where certain parts of this aspect, for example, V and V, um, are highlighted and all this kind of input needs to be consolidated in this top level kind of standards. And of course, also on the right hand side, what you can see here, there are also some, let's say, traffic rules that need to be considered. And this is also very much differently on the different, in the different nations. And when you talk about safety for automated vehicles, this kind of systems must be able to handle all these different, different rules according um, for the region where they are at the end um, released to. So let's come to the last slide, please, right now. Um, so how are we going to continue with that? So I just explained that we are on the way to release this um, technical report for 804. This is going to happen um, in August this year. And we see that um, this kind of top level document needs to be converted into a proper ISO standard. Right now it's just a technical report, but this is good for the time being because a lot of the technology is still under development, is making a lot of progress. So nothing is really um, finally fixed, it's work in progress. But with um, all the companies working on such kind of systems are achieving more and more maturity into, into their systems. The next step is of course to make also more mature or more stable and long-term stable ISO um, standard document out of that. And this is going to be the technical specification. We will continue with that work or start this work with a kickoff in November this year and plan to release it by mid-2023. And then we see that with this kind of, let's say, top-level standardization activity, we can achieve harmonized level of safety for all the um, product um, manufacturers that will release automated systems at the end of the day. So I think this is um, the summary of my presentation. So I hand back right now to Paul and to continue the Q&A session. Great, Simon, that was fantastic. And thanks thanks for going through that in, in quite uh, quite detail. That was, that was really good. Um, and so good that we have a ton of questions that have come in as you were talking. And I, I suspect we'll have a few more come in as, as we go through the Q&A and the kind of Grouped into two session, sections, there's the, the first group, and I'll, I'll ask these first, about, are about the BMW system, and then there's a bunch of questions about global policy for automated vehicles. So um, the first one, uh, this one actually comes from a self-proclaimed longtime BMW owner, um, curious about timeline. When will we start seeing this in uh, BMW showrooms um, across the world, and, and what countries do you think will be first? Okay, so um, let's start with the countries. So um, I have shown this in, in the slide deck and um, we have three major regions where we um, like to release this product. This is of course the home market Europe and our major market the US. And of course also um, very important in, in China and in US and, and, and Europe are always very close to each other as the driving behaviors also and the regulatory aspects are quite close, but China is always a little bit different. But this is, let's say, the three major markets we're developing the products for. Um, when will it come to the market? So we are in the middle of the development and we will release, and uh, let's say, this in a new vehicle architecture mid next year. And then, of course, we will still continue to de develop this kind of automated technology. And when it's um, mature enough, then we will also make it available within the vehicles. But the final dates are not fixed because for us, the principle is safety first. And before we cannot really ensure that these vehicles will operate really safely on the roads, we will not release them to the customers. But from, from the technology point of view, um, this also providing the appropriate sensors and hardware setup, we think with the new generation starting with next year, 
we are in a position to start to release this step by step. Yeah. It's not a big Got thing it. at the end. I think this needs to be understood. Got it. Okay, that's helpful. And within that, um, another question about the technology specifically. Does the, the vehicle use both LIDAR and radar to, um, to detect objects and respond to them? Um, can you talk a little bit about the, the equipment? Okay, yeah. When we talk about the sensor system, we definitely use camera, cameras, multiple, multiple cameras. It will use one LIDAR um, front facing and um, it will also use a couple of radars. Yes, at the end it's always a combination of these three sensors that are applies at the end for the best, let's say, um, detectability during the different weather and boundary conditions. But yes, we will have all three within such a vehicle. Got it. And then in terms of things that you're detecting, right, there are a lot of external actors outside of the vehicle that the, the that BMW can control. Um, not only other vehicles on the roadway, but also pedestrians, bicyclists, um, how is, does the technology accommodate for that, and, and what, what kind of safety measures do you have to protect those users? Okay, so first of all, we need to state that, um, that the initial release will be a highway pilot. And one of the reasons, of course, is that this is a very well-defined environment um, where you cannot expect um, pedestrians walking around, at least not in, in well-controlled areas. And um, it's, it's not an urban pilot at the beginning. So. We talk for the first release on the highway pilot to really um, reduce the complexity of the driving scenarios we can expect. And this is the way how you can also start handling that. And I think from, from the inside technology, it's a combination of, um, let's say, classical control algorithm approaches combined with AI-based approaches. And this is what we think gives the best redundancy at the end to the system to be really um, in a safe operation. Got it. Um, and then kind of switching into the policy piece a little bit is this the concept with level three where, um, you know, the, the system is responsible for monitoring the driving environment. Um, how does the, the BMW level three system work from a human machine interface? And how do you take that control from the vehicle and assign it back to the, uh, the human occupant? when that's warranted and what happens if the human is unresponsive. Can you give a little insight into how that interaction works? Okay, of course, this also always goes also in, into design of the vehicle, of the interior design, and this is where I cannot talk so much about. But of course, um, you can expect that um, a lot of this interface will be um, at the steering wheel so that the driver can really properly see and um, this indications at the steering wheel how this works. But at the end, um, this is still something where we make a lot of um, usability analysis with different kind of drivers and where I cannot go into further details right now as this is um, very much linked to the interior design of the car. And this is, of course, always very secret till we release the car. Got it. So um, I want to shift a little bit more to the public policy side of things. That was really important, I think, to kind of talk about what the global landscape is. And there's a, a hunger to learn from what other countries are doing. Um, you talked a lot about harmonization and, and a lot of groups involved. In terms of U.S. players and maybe some of the major U.S. manufacturers like uh, GM, Ford, Chrysler, Tesla, um, who is involved with uh, creating that, that report um, and you know, who's been important? And, and I guess not just on the vehicle side, but also bus manufacturers, truck manufacturers. Um, what, uh, how much was yeah. the U.S. involvement in that sense? So currently, when also when we started with that, it was the white paper and the white paper and the participating U.S. companies. This have been active. Um, then we have had um, FCA as uh, the major o one of the three major OEMs from the U.S. And of course, Intel was was in there, and um, also here as the map provider. So um, this was um, let's say a very good group of four companies that could really address all the the major aspects. And right now, with um, pushing this all in, into ISO level, um, we have a couple of, of more players, and some of them are really active. Some others, um, according to ISO rules, um, just act um, more on the national side. But perhaps to mention one of the, the very important players is just um, NVIDIA, for example, and um, being a big technology provider, also joined um, actively into this group right now. Yeah? Got it. No, that's really interesting. And that, we are know, talking kind of... with all of these companies for, for the next kickoff when we go in, into the um, second edition with this new ISO standard in November 
um, there that we try um, to really um, extend um, all over the world to the, the participating OEMs. Yeah, that's great. Now, both both a mixture of OEMs and tech companies. That's that's great. This is the, um, the really key success factor, I think. Exactly. A couple questions. I know we're at the bottom of the hour, but I want to make sure we we hit as many of these policy questions. Um, so we'll go for a few more minutes. Um, talk a little bit about, and when you talk about harmonization, a couple questions came up about uh, traffic control devices. So not necessarily just the laws, but actually how how the the signals and signs are on the roadways. Um, is there any efforts to both update that for automated technologies um, and harmonize them across uh, country borders? So I think currently we, we, are, we cannot expect that this will really change in, in a recent time because even when you have some kind of, uh, let's say, harmonization efforts on that, till you roll this out and update that, it will take many, many years. And this is typically too long. So we expect that our systems we are building, they have to be able to handle, let's say, traffic signs and let's say the, the traffic environment in general as it is today. And of course, when we talk about you know, more complex scenarios or more enhanced scenarios, we always can talk about that certain rules get, let's say, electronic upgrades so that you have communication with the infrastructure. And this is where a lot of projects are ongoing. But I think I'm, I'm currently not in a position to announce any dates when, when this will come. But of course, this will help very much to even make, make the whole traffic more controlled when you have more than very few automated vehicles and you have many automated vehicles and the infrastructure can communicate with them then you have very big opportunities to further enhance the whole traffic control got it um and in terms of looking at other countries a question that often comes up and has several times here in, in the, the the questions on this webinar is what country is doing it best uh where where in the world do you think they are having the right approach to public policy to uh, ensure safety and also make sure that this this technology is ready for uh, commercialization. So, so I think that the policies are differently. So when you have a look at Europe and the US, so in the US, um, you go more for the self-assessment and give it to the responsibility of the vehicle manufacturer. And this gives you the, the, the quick step into the market. But then of course, the liability issues in the US are typically um, more severe than here in Europe. And in Europe, we have more the uh, different approach that we have the regulations first. And, and then um, when, you, when you follow them, you're, you're quite safe also with respect to, to later on liability. This is um, two different approaches, but as has been W as a global player for many, many years, we are used to work with both of these systems. Yeah, They have pros and cons, and I would not say one is better than the other. They are just different and give you different opportunities. Fair They're point. not the best company for automated driving, I would say today. Sure. Um, and then last question, I know we're, know we're a few minutes over, but um, you know, a couple of years ago, they, there was an attempt to pass legislation here in the United States that would kind of set up a framework for automated vehicle policy. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, either, not necessarily that law, but, but what kind of framework should we be doing beyond our current voluntary safety self-assessment here in the US? Um, what are some things that the federal government can be doing to proactively prepare uh, and ensure safety for automated vehicle systems when and if and when they, they come out. Okay, so let me try to give a more political answer instead of going into details that should be in there. So currently we work on such kind of regulations here in Europe. So taxes are being drafted, the tax is already being drafted, ALKS is one of the starting points. And of course, for, for any kind of global OEM, it would be most beneficial in case these kind of, let's say, regulations we have prepared here would be very similar than in the US because then it's one rule and you have to follow that one instead of having a different one in another country. Got it. Of okay. course, That's this good. requires that this um, two, let's say, um, big regions on the world cooperate in creating this, this document. It's not just saying take them over, jointly create them. This is the message here. Got it. No, that, that's really interesting. Okay, well, we're a few minutes over. Simon, I really appreciate you uh, staying on the line for 35 minutes and, and kind of giving um, your your full analysis of what's going on with, with BMW and with AV policy around the world. Um, again, for everybody on the phone, um, please remember that uh, this recording will be available online 
in about an hour or two, um, along with the slides. So that's that will all be available on Eno's website. Um, and you know, we will be following up with a few folks that we were unable to get to the questions. So again, thank you for everyone for um, submitting those questions. Please stay tuned for future Eno webinars. And again, thank you, Simon, so much um, for your time this afternoon. Uh, and we look forward to continuing the conversation with you in the future. Okay, thank you, Paul, for the nice moderation and thank you to the audience for listening to this webinar. It was a pleasure to me, thank you. Great, thank you so much.